Uh, look, I've chosen um, food for the basis of my um, talk tonight. It's not a big talk, it's part of my welcome to country, and I like to make it entertaining and make it relevant to the occasion that we're gathered here today. And I've chosen food because food is one of the priorities of sustainability to our existence. Food sovereignty is, is an affirmation of who we are as a nation, and at least one of the ways to restore our relationship with the world around us. And to borrow a quote from George Bernard Shaw, he says, there is no love sincere than the love of food, unquote. So hello everybody, as you've heard, my name is Carol Peterson, and um, look, it's not a chore for me to drive to Jeremung up tonight. That's where my heart and soul is up there in the bush. To begin the formal part of today's Sustainable Living Festival, let's acknowledge that where we gather today, that this is Noongar Buja, Kanjaling Buja, Manang Buja. In echoing these acknowledgements, it reminds us that Noongar people traditionally practiced sustainable living for thousands of years. Food resources, particularly, were sustained through our totemic system. For instance, there were some clan groups that could eat food that was not allowed to be eaten by other clan groups and vice versa. And this was according to their totemic system, which in practice was sustainable and, and, and enabling the land to continue to pro provide. As I mentioned before, food is our priority in our basic sustainability. The nomadic movement, once criticised by colonists, was to allow, allow the land to regenerate and for the movement of animals. This practice was a pure form of conservation. Today's festival, festival is about sustainable living and examining ways in which we can do it better. Food for the body is not enough. There must be food for the soul. Through consciousness, our minds have the power to change our world and ourselves. It is time to heed the wisdom of the Indigenous people and channel our consciousness and spirit to attend the gardens. This is a shared activity, no matter who, culture, creed or colour. And I ask that you share with me in acknowledging that this is Noongar land. And with that, I give you a welcome to country. Gemma Green is a fabulous um, mixture in terms of her background of finance and business, sustainability research, a consultant, for example, put together a report with a team on Pilbara 2050, looking at the future for the Pilbara and putting a whole range of innovative and sustainability options there. She's an innovative business developer. She's involved with practical projects on the ground, like the White Gum Valley project, which she's going to share with us. This is what we need. We need to hear and to generate that motivation to think about fresh ideas and to use those ideas and experience to ask that question of how we can contribute and how our local governments can contribute, what our development commission can do, pressed by us the most powerful of all of the means of change is actually uh, people. People change governments, people change local governments, people change the behaviour, they are the business people. We are the people who can make the greatest difference. So the question tonight that was posed and that Gemma is going to uh, talk to is how do we transition to a low carbon, livable, innovative towns and cities? What really is possible? So let's give a warm welcome to Gemma Green. I uh, have called the talk this evening Citizen Utilities. And uh, I've done that 
a little bit uh, similar to the term prosumer, which was actually coined by a guy called Toffler in 1981. Um, so it's a term that's been around for quite a long time, but it's been kind of co-opted for energy more recently. And it's the notion that uh, in energy we used to be the supplied and now we're the suppliers. And there's a reconception of energy that's happening uh, and it's happening in Australia um, faster than it is in other parts of the world. And it's also happening down here in the Great Southern region as well, which I've discovered over the past couple of days in my travels around town. So I'm going to talk with you about what's happening internationally, uh, what's happening locally in Australia, in Western Australia, and also a little bit about what I, I've seen going on here, which is very exciting. So uh, I'll start off by um, uh, just showing you a graph. Who has never heard the term disruptive innovation? Just a couple of you. The term disruptive innovation was coined by a Harvard business professor called Clayton Christensen. And uh, he saw this phenomena happening where big companies didn't see change coming and then they went bankrupt. And uh, it's become a very popular phrase and this graph shows how much it's being used in academic literature. So it's grown exponentially in its use and it's almost become a ubiquitous term. In fact, our Prime Minister uses this term quite often now. Uh, and when I started my PhD in 2013, uh, not very many people had heard the term, but m a lot of people now um, know about it. And uh, I'm going to speak with you about uh, how uh, solar and battery storage and other renewables are a disruptive innovation to our centralised and largely fossil fuel based energy system. First of all, uh, this is the growth in uh, renewable energy and you can see that uh, the Asia Pacific region has the lion's share of growth in new energies and that's for the past eight years running. And if you look at this next slide, the composition of those energies, uh, solar is taking up the lion's share of that. And the actual total amount peaked in 2015 at uh, about $380 billion, but there's steady growth year on year. And now there's more money spent in new energies than there is in traditional ener energies, which are fossil fuel based energies. And that's a trend that's been the case now for nearly a decade. It's quite remarkable. In fact, you, you'll be hard pressed to find uh, any uh, high income OECD country that is going to be building uh, new uh, fossil fuel based, particularly coal based uh, generation capacity. If you look globally into the future, the graph on the left shows the global energy mix now, where solar is only about 4%. But this rapid growth will mean that out to 2040, solar will be about 30% of the global energy mix. So it's very exciting and it's happening very fast. And uh, this is a breakdown of the composition of large scale solar versus small scale solar. And you can see in Australia, there's a skew. We have far more uh, small scale solar than we do large scale. And the opposite is the case in the United States and in Europe, it's somewhere between. And there are other features, if you like, that are unique to Australia. Uh, this graph here shows the growth in electricity prices compared against the consumer price index. And you can see that uh, our electricity prices have grown exponentially in line with the CPI. This is actually unique to Australia. So we have very high electricity prices, which is annoying on one hand, the one hand, but it's also an enormous opportunity on another. And the reason is because the economics of alternative energies will make sense and is making sense here faster than in other parts of the world. And this is a graph showing the decline in battery storage. And the, the arrow you can see there, the Tesla Powerwall, that was an announcement made by Elon Musk, who is the founder of Tesla, uh, on the 30th of April 2015. And it pushed the price of batteries down much further than they were at the time. And since then, they've come down even more. And uh, as a result of that, this is part of my doctoral research, I looked at when will solar and battery storage compete with grid-based electricity pricing? And the answer is next year. I'm not suggesting that at that moment uh, there'll be mass adoption. But uh, when the price difference gets to around 20% cheaper, 
than the grid, then I think we will be start, we'll still we'll start to see mainstream adoption. And I'm not the only person saying that or the organisation saying that. Uh, Morgan Stanley, Bloomberg New Energy Finance are all forecasting this uh, future as a reality uh, very soon. Uh, the reason why battery prices are coming down is not um, some random thing. Uh, in fact, if you compare the decline in price in solar, rooftop solar and battery prices, they're coming down in price at almost exactly the same rate, which is kind of curious. But if we look further, um, there's a phenomena called Rogers diffusion curve, which explains this. And what Rogers diffusion curve is, it says that when a new technology is created, its cost per unit is very expensive. And you only really see uh, the innovators and early adopters buying it. But as they buy it, the cost per unit comes down. And then you see the early majority followed by the later majority buying it. And uh, when it becomes a mainstream item, the cost per unit becomes very low. If you look at technologies since uh, the early 1900s, this is the same. So going back as early as when electricity was invented to the invention of the radio to more recent innovations like the hairdryer or a microwave. I don't actually have a microwave in my house, but I know when they first came out, they cost $1,500. And you can pick one up now for $50 if you wanted to. And that's all because of Rogers diffusion curve and this phenomena. But if you look at this graph, one thing that's interesting to note is that the, the most recent technologies, the, the, the curve is steeper. And what that tells us is that people today are adopting technologies at a faster rate than what they did uh, previously. So we're consuming technology at a faster rate. So mainstream adoption of technologies is faster. Um, so uh, as part of my doctoral research, I put a battery in Josh Burns' house. Some of you may have heard of Josh. He's on ABC Gardening, Gardening Australia, and he built a 10-star home in Hilton, which is in the city of Fremantle. Uh, and it was, it's the first uh, uh, grid-connected battery in Perth. And although Josh was producing far more electricity than he needed uh, from his three kilowatt solar system, he still got a very large bill, and he was still very reliant on the grid. And that's because the time of day that the solar panels were producing electricity was not when his household was needing it. So he was exporting a lot of electricity during the day and then buying back electricity from the grid at night. And so uh, uh, as a part of my doctoral research, I put in a, a 10 kilowatt hour battery into Josh's house. And the graph on the left shows you before the battery. And so you can see the solar was providing about 45% of his household's needs. Bearing in mind, the solar panels were producing about 75% more electricity than he needed. So he's exporting a lot. Uh, and then after the battery was installed, it's just 3% reliant on the grid. And you might ask, well, why didn't we just go that last 3%? Um, were we being lazy? No, the answer is uh, we weren't. What, uh, the reason why we didn't go 100% uh, is because it's very expensive. And that is because in winter time, you have a few consecutive days where the sun is not shining. And if you wanted to uh, supply the house with renewables, you'd need a battery 66% larger and a solar system 66% larger. And if you weren't grid connected, uh, you would be producing far more electricity than you needed and it would go to waste. And it really runs counter to the principles of sustainability, plus the payback uh, period on that additional capacity would be longer than the asset life. So it just didn't make sense to, to do that. And although a lot of people have this idea of wanting to go off grid, and actually it's something that I used to aspire to. I think now that it's a bit of a romantic notion and really this idea of interconnectedness facilitated by the grid that prosumers are trading electricity with each other and is, is really the future. And I'll talk with you a bit more about um, what I've done as a result of seeing that uh, opportunity. And so Josh remains grid connected and he's selling 76% of his uh, electricity back to Synergy that he doesn't need, and uh, his house is you know, virtually renewable energy autonomous. Uh, but as a result of households installing solar, 
they're using the grid a little bit less. And with battery storage, they're storing the solar during the day and avoiding purchasing electricity from the grid at night. And so this spells problems for the utilities. And this um, graph basically shows you the impact of households storing their electricity, uh, their solar electricity in the battery and avoiding buying it from the grid at night. And it's a story of decline in utilisation of the grid. And as a result of that, those that don't have renewables may have to pay a higher tariff. And the forecast at the high end here is 22% extra for access to the network. Uh, and so it, it's this whole death spiral scenario. And it's a bit of a problem because uh, a lot of people, even with the best payback period, not everyone can afford solar panels. And uh, essential services still need the grid. And uh, high density cities also need the grid because you can really only fit enough uh, renewable energy on your roof space if you're five storeys or below. Once you get above that, you, you really are going to need another source of electricity to supply energy to the building. So there's a few conundrums there that we're going to talk through this evening. Uh, but in terms of the Australian context, uh, at the moment we've got nearly 20% of households nationally with the rooftop solar, and uh, it's 5.7 gigawatts, it's quite a lot. And it's happened in a short space of time, since 2001 really, uh, and uh, last year, there was 15% growth in rooftop solar. And in Perth, uh, there's about 25% uh, penetration of rooftop solar. So one in uh, four households is quite remarkable. And uh, although um, that's very impressive, if you look at the breakdown of the types of houses that do have rooftop solar, it's mainly free freehold households. And that's not all of the housing stock. Um, what this, these graphs show is a breakdown of, of all the states and territories and the different types of houses. So uh, dark blue is semi-detached, so that's the, the colour up the top, but down the bottom that shows different types of houses like semi-detached apartments, villas, and uh, they're quite a big part of the housing supply. In fact, 25% of the housing stock in Australia are, are dwellings other than freehold houses, and they've got virtually no renewables. So there's a real gap and an opportunity here. And I saw this with uh, my doctoral research and decided to try and do something about it. Uh, and this is the um, amount of new buildings that fall into that category. So although 25% of the existing housing stock uh, is this kind of uh, uh, multi-unit dwellings, if you like, uh, of the new housing supply, it's a far greater number. So this is just um, over recent years. And if you look at 2016, it's 45%. So uh, it's a big part of the, the new housing supply coming online. And uh, the reason for that is, is uh, infield targets. So cities around Australia are targeting more density and more of these kinds of dwellings by extension. So in Perth, the target's 47%, and uh, in other places, it's, it's far greater, um, you can see here. So we can expect far more of this type of uh, housing uh, in our cities. And so we need a way to be able to provide renewable energy to those uh, dwellings, because we know consumers want it. And um, this is some 3D modelling that we've done for the city of Perth. Um, showing all the different buildings. And then we've broken the buildings um, into different types to look at different heights and different types of buildings. So strata buildings where there's apartments uh, that are five storeys or below or certain commercial buildings. So we're looking at how many of these buildings could retrofit renewables into them and how much of, uh, it's, uh, of the electricity needs of the city could be supplied autonomously inside the city walls. And you can see we've broken down um, looking at office and residential, commercial and then uh, redevelopment zones as well. And so we're doing this analysis uh, nationally uh, as a part of a research project with uh, ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and some other partners and I'll talk you through those in a minute. But the reason why up until now we haven't had a lot of renewables in this part of the property market is several fold. One is property developers are for the most part wanting to just do things normally and just connect the electricity in, in the system, in, sorry, in the building as per normal. 
Uh, if they were to supply solar and batteries, it means they have to spend more up front and it's complicated uh, to design the energy systems. It's expensive. And if you've got an apartment uh, and you wanted to put renewables in, you don't own the roof space, so you can't just put solar panels on the roof. Uh, so there's a quite a lot of reasons why the, this hasn't happened until now, that the way that it would be governed, the way the solar and energy system would be managed, uh, that hadn't been thought about or resolved. So there's quite a lot of barriers to overcome. And uh, to try and overcome some of these, we've uh, been working on a case study at WGV in the suburb of White Gum Valley in the city of Fremantle. And uh, this is the project here. It's um, on an old school site, the old Kim Beasley school site next to a golf course. And uh, the, the surrounding area uh, besides the golf course are all single storey residential. So it was density in an area that hadn't seen density before. And often that can be something that's scary to uh, you know, the community. But Landcorp, who are the land uh, development agency here, did a really great job engaging with the community. And uh, there's a lot of innovations here that I'm not going to talk through tonight. But it's worth going and having a look on the website to see. Like, for example, there was a massive sump that was fenced off and really ugly and inaccessible. And they've put a membrane in it and made it into a landscape garden and it's now a playground for children. And so they used some of the funds from doing the, the development to uh, rehabilitate um, this area. And there's plenty of other things besides the energy work that I'm gonna talk with you about um, this evening. These are all the different uh, partners involved in the project. So I mentioned Arena and Landcorp, but there's four property developers doing four apartment buildings uh, on site and uh, Western Power as well as uh, Synergy too. So I'm just going to show you a little video about this project and then I'll um, move back to the slides. Just bear with me a second. Great to be a part of the launch today of the trial of the solar and battery power generation in the White Gum Valley uh, housing development. Over a four year trial period, you'll be able to demonstrate, hopefully, to the broader public, to developers, to those that are involved with development uh, across our state, that this is in fact something that's workable, something we can uh, uh, make a core part of any development so that all users in there can get the benefit of having uh, solar energy and, uh, and also reduce cost living. The Gen Y demonstration housing project that Landcorp embarked on um, last year basically set to um, see a, an architect designed house that responded to the requirements or needs of the Gen Y um, generation. It's going to be in Australia first for doing an apartment building with the solar and batteries on strata and developing a governance framework that can uh, make that a reality. There's three apartments within this uh, development and we're putting in uh, nine kilowatts of solar PV and a 10 kilowatt hour battery. It's about um, storing your excess solar generation during the day so that you can keep it and use it at night and uh, instead of being paid seven cents for it, actually offset electricity um, costs at more like 27 cents or 30 cents, depending on where you are rather than buying expensive grid-based electricity. Within the Gen Y apartments, um, we're looking to reduce grid electricity consumption by 60% and reduce overall electricity consumption by 30% compared against perf norms. This is a sealed battery. It doesn't need maintenance. You don't have to top it up. You don't have to store chemicals around it. It just works, and it works well. And I think that makes it a very sustainable technology. We always knew we had to have a more renewable future, but the holy grail was storage. How do you get the storage to work? Uh, it was always too expensive and not very safe, but this is safe and cheap, and we can do it uh, and use it, but we need demonstrations to be able to show how it works. If you can begin to demonstrate wealth improvements, livability improvements, and footprint reductions. That's the big agenda for our generation.
So that's a little um, insight into the Gen Y uh, housing development at WGV, which is one of the four apartment buildings. This is the first one. It's just been completed, so you can actually uh, visit it in Perth. And if you do come to Perth, do get in touch and um, you can uh, come and uh, visit the site and see this plus the other innovations. And there's three more apartment buildings currently under construction. The next one will be completed in May and the last two uh, towards the end of this year. And uh, that's the um, energy system design for Gen Y. And uh, electric vehicles are part of the story. So we're installing a shared EV at WGV, which will be uh, located at one of the apartment buildings and the EV charger can be used by other people that have electric vehicles that want to charge them. And the idea is to really reduce the car ownership and the use of petrol cars. Uh, although, so shared vehicles uh, really work when you reduce cars by say, ten, around 10 cars less, you need one shared car to replace that because share cars um, often provide, well, in cities at least, they are used for all the extra journeys other than your daily commute. So if you locate your development in walkable distance to the city or good quality public transport links, then uh, you actually don't need that many shared EVs either. But if you're in a, a more remote place, um, such as the Great Southern Region, um, there'd be slightly different metrics. But I did see today a Tesla uh, being charged out the front and I have heard that there are some EVs here and uh, I think that there's a real opportunity to look at um, shared EVs uh, and uh, shared vehicles just in general to reduce uh, car ownership. Um, and the, uh, the graphs up here show uh, the, the declining price in batteries and the demand for uh, EVs and they're perfectly inversely correlated. And that's because about one third of the cost of an electric vehicle is the battery. And by 2022, so not that long away, uh, electric vehicles will cost no more than a petrol car. And that's the point of lift off for sales. And so by 2020, I think there'll be a major part of the new car market. And uh, I think there will be the mainstream type of vehicle we'll have in Australia uh, you know, easily by 2030. Uh, and it's hard to imagine it right now because there's so few of them, but uh, Roger's diffusion curve is at play here. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you now about the blockchain. Uh, who has heard of the blockchain? A few of you. So uh, when I designed the solar and the battery system for the apartment building, I was looking for a software platform that could handle uh, how to allocate units of electricity to each apartment and uh, do the billing and the payments off the back of it. And I couldn't find something that really transparently handled this. And um, I was introduced in January of last year to a couple of blockchain developers who uh, had developed a solution for something other than energy. And I was like, what on earth is this blockchain? Started looking into it and saw that it was a cryptocurrency for the Bitcoin and it was all very confusing. But I looked further and saw that there was an energy project in New York that was using the blockchain. And it took me a while scratching my head, but I'm gonna try and explain it to you now very simply. So what the blockchain is, it's a, a database uh, and it's a, a single database that uh, buyers and sellers use. So normally when uh, transactions happen, the buyer and the seller each have their own records and they have to reconcile the information in each other's databases to settle payments with each other. And you can see that in the energy markets, for wholesale energy markets, it's 60 to 90 days to, from when you generate and sell the electricity to when you get paid. On the Australian Stock Exchange, when you're buying and selling shares, there's a three-day settlement process, and that's because of the time it takes to reconcile the databases. And what the blockchain is, is a single database that both counterparties, or both the buyer and the seller, use. And so you can settle the payment at the, the moment the deal's struck, or more optimally. And why it's called the blockchain is it's blocks of data chained together. And uh, the way the database works is it's got 
predefined rules uh, of how it, it will operate and how it won't. And if you want to write an entry in the database, in the ledger, uh, you need to comply with the rules. So what you can see here is wherever it's black is the rules being met and so the entry is put into the database. And wherever it doesn't comply with the rules, it doesn't get entered and that's the, the red cross. And the Bitcoin blockchain was developed in 2009 and there's billions of dollars traded on it every day. And even though no one's in control of it, it's super safe, it's never been hacked. And so it's this kind of remarkable thing that was invented for the Bitcoin, which is a currency that doesn't have a, a country. And normally with a currency, you have a reserve bank that holds all the information about a currency. And so it was thought that this couldn't possibly work and yet it has. So it was used for the, the, the blockchain was used for the Bitcoin, but people started to realize many different applications. And it's almost like the Philosopher's Stone. It's got these seemingly endless and magical properties. Obviously, it isn't the silver bullet for everything and it does have limitations. But I started to see uh, that it could handle prosumers trading electricity with each other and settling the payments from transacting electricity. And it could handle the electricity within the apartment buildings in terms of allocating units to each apartment. And if someone wasn't home to consume their electricity, they could trade it with their neighbour and be paid for that. And so uh, this is just looking at the blockchain uh, on the right and on the left, the traditional way that business is done. So you normally have an intermediary or an exchange that manages and settles the payments between the buyer and the seller, like, the, like a stock exchange. Uh, but with the blockchain, you can uh, transact peer-to-peer -peer without the intermediary. So it's, it's a, a new conception of, of commerce and of trading with, um, uh, in the marketplace in, in many sectors. And uh, these are some of the applications for it. So Enome is for medical records. At the moment, your doctor holds your medical records. And if you go to a specialist, they send information to the specialist. But using the Enome platform, you own your medical records in encrypted format and you provide access to your doctor and, and your medical specialists. Uh, and uh, Uprove is an uh, application for parking infringements. Uh, not many people will like this, but... Uh, Parking inspectors, when they take a photo of your car, how do you know when that photo was taken or where? But using the blockchain, you can embed in the photograph the geographical coordinates of where the photo was taken and when, and uh, it can be used as evidence um, to support a parking fine. Uh, and then I mentioned the stock exchange. The Australian Stock Exchange is trialling the use of the blockchain to settle stock transactions uh, more optimally and uh, energy. So pa PowerLedger uh, is a company that I founded with four other people in May of last year and uh, it's a blockchain uh, technology company in the energy sector and it enables peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity and the management of electricity within buildings. Uh, and the blockchain in the energy space has caught the attention of quite a lot of large organisations. So this is some of the research that's been put out about it. So Allens and Linklater's, Lawyers, Deloitte's, Morgan Stanley, the DINA, which is the German energy agency. Um, these are all public, you can get hold of them. Uh, and then Bloomberg New Energy Finance have put out this research. Uh, that's not publicly available, but if you'd like a copy, I can provide you with one. And this is looking at uh, this whole new conception of energy where, uh, where prosumers are enabled by uh, technologies like the blockchain to be able to trade with each other. And uh, how it works is at the moment, if you, uh, at the top of the slide, if you've got surplus electricity from your solar panels, you sell it back to Synergy and then Synergy sells it on to somebody else. Um, but at the bottom, using the PowerLedger platform, uh, you can just trade directly with your neighbour or your mum or the cat haven and, um, and settle the payments between you. And uh, this is basically how you, you basically set up your system. Um, you sign up on an app or a website and you just put in your metre number and basically uh, hand, uh, your bank details and it, it handles the settlement associated with that. And uh, this is uh, what the actual assistant platform looks like. So this is um, exporting and importing of a, a project that we did in Bustleton. Uh, 
and you can see this is the actual blockchain. So this is the database showing each kilowatt hour produced and the register uh, on the database on the blockchain. Um, this is a project, our first project that we did in Bustleton at the National Lifestyle Villages with 15 homes and um, it, uh, it got quite a lot of attention. The West Australian wrote an article about it, that got written about in the New York Times, quite exciting. And uh, of the 15 homes that we trialled, about half didn't have renewables, so they were able to buy um, solar electricity from their neighbours at a price lower than it, that they could buy it from Synergy. And those with surplus solar sold it to their neighbours uh, and got a rate higher than the feed-in tariff. So we showed how that works. And we've got another trial in New Zealand, in Auckland, with a company called Vector, which is like Western Power in Auckland. And uh, that's uh, about to go live of 500 sites trading electricity between each other. Uh, so I mentioned the peer-to-peer -peer trading and within buildings. So we've got the product for apartment buildings. Uh, and there are other applications for the blockchain. So autonomous intelligent asset trading. What that means is you could have a wind farm or a solar farm and you can use the blockchain to uh, buy fractions of ownership of the farm and also receive the income associated with selling electricity from it. And at the moment, if you want to build a, a, a large solar farm or a wind farm, you need what's called a power purchase agreement. And it's quite hard to get one to be able to connect. But using the blockchain, that solar farm could sell electricity to many households and connect to the network. So we could see much more renewables connect to the, to the grid using this um, technology as an enabler. Now, incumbent utilities. I mentioned at the beginning this death spiral and with consumers becoming prosumers, uh, they're relying less on the grid. And incumbent utilities can do one or a combination of three things. They can fight, flight, or innovate. And uh, fighting takes uh, a few different forms. It's opposing the deployment of renewable energy. And we've seen that happening in Australia. Uh, renewables being blamed for problems in our energy system uh, as a justification for not being able to put any more renewables on the system. We're seeing this uh, playing out. And another way of fighting is increasing the fixed price. So it doesn't matter whether you buy electricity from the grid, you pay a very high fixed price um, to the utilities and we can see that happening as well. So that's fighting. Flighting uh, can be either doing nothing, so the utilities might just do nothing and pretend like nothing's happening, or they might sell uh, their investments. And you're seeing some of the existing utilities doing that right now. So they're divesting their interests or shares in coal-fired power stations, gas-fired power stations, or networks. Uh, and so uh, they might uh, flight um, from, from the sector. And then finally, innovate. innovate can be offering consumers solar and battery systems, offering them ways to save on electricity by giving them a, an app on their phone or home monitoring systems to reduce their energy consumption. And there are many utilities that are starting to do this or starting to offer to install solar and batteries uh, inside apartment buildings for no money up front. So you get renewable energy, but you, you keep paying your electricity bill to the, the utilities, and sometimes they're fighting and innovating at the same time. And actually, there's quite a lot of that going on in Australia and internationally as well. But in terms of disruptive innovation theory, um, if you look at um, companies like Kodak uh, that went bankrupt in 2012, Kodak actually invented the technology for digital cameras, and they had filed many patents. They had seen the size of the market, the digital camera market was enormous and they wanted to get a slice of the action, but they hadn't understood the business models that would underpin uh, digital cameras versus film cameras. And so it's not just about understanding the technology to be able to innovate, you need to understand what are the governance frameworks, what are the commercial models to be able to sell that in, into the marketplace. So innovating isn't a guarantee of survival, but without innovating, there certainly is no guarantee of survival. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, and so I think that in Australia, we are uniquely placed to um, 
take advantage of some of the opportunities. And uh, yesterday I, I had the fortune to go and visit a project called Deco Housing in Denmark, which is a, a strata development of 12 lots that will be uh, using solar and storage. And uh, although uh, you might think that you know, the most innovative things are happening out there in the world, not here. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I, actually from what I've seen, and it's my first time to the Great Southern, this trip, I'm really, I'm very inspired by what's happening and there's so much leading edge work happening here. So uh, that is really, um, yeah, heartening to see and uh, that, that you are actually a test bed for what's possible and that you'll be able to sell some of your innovations to other parts of Australia or indeed the world. And I hope to use the DECO uh, project as a case study with some of my doctoral students. But in terms of the opportunity uh, here in Australia, I think it's very enormous. It's not an accident that Tesla have chosen Australia as their prime market to deploy. And it's because of this almost perfect storm we have nearly 300 days of sunshine every year here in the West, and nationally a lot of sunshine, very high electricity prices, strong consumer demand for renewables, and a lot, uh, a mainstream uptake of renewables. And uh, the economics of uh, solar and batteries uh, making sense here, paying themselves off quickly. And so I think that it's not just about the solar and the battery systems, it's about how they're used and applied and, and community ownership and uh, embedded networks in, in apartment buildings, I think, are going to be retrofitted in to uh, existing housing and also the new housing stock. It will become the norm very quickly. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I think for the past century, our energy system has remained relatively unchanged. We basically had large power stations, coal and gas-fired power stations, transmission lines, distribution lines, bringing electricity to our home. So when uh, you know, we turn on the light switch, the light comes on. And in the past seven or eight years, this new system is emerging. Instead of a unidirectional system, it's a bi-directional system. Instead of consumers, we have prosumers. Uh, and instead of centralised energy, we have a hybrid system of distributed energy and differential power from centralised energy systems. So, uh, and now electric vehicles becoming more affordable. And so I, I, I don't know what our energy system of tomorrow will look like, but personally, I'm very hopeful. And uh, one thing is for sure, uh, it won't feel like energy as usual. Thank you. We're going to have a, uh, a question and answer time. I'll have a, uh, a microphone that I can bring to you so that uh, you can ask some questions. And, but I'm going to kick off with a, a question because knowing that Gemma's also a councillor on the city of Perth, so she's got uh, personal experience of looking at, well, what is the opportunity through local government? So I'll just kick off with that particular question. Sure. I think that councils could uh, require renewables as standard or require that the roof space is optimally designed to allow for the instalment of renewables. And I don't think that will cost, the, the roof space won't cost any more. And uh, a $2,000 solar system, when you look at the build cost for uh, a house, is negligible. And so I think it's almost a no-brainer now not to be doing that. In fact, I, I'd probably go as far to say that it's criminal not to be doing that. Uh, it's not some, you know, wacky technology. It's proven. We know that they last 25 years. They pay themselves off in three years. And uh, particularly for uh, affordable housing, I think it just has such a profound impact on the household um, expenditure. Thanks. Can people just pop up their hands if you've got a question you'd like to ask? Um, you acknowledge that the grid will still need to exist, but um, what shape will it 
you know, what would it look like if we've got people swapping energy between themselves or, you know, taking it in and out? Sure. So the size of the transmission system, so they're the big power uh, lines, I think that that would need to be smaller because we won't be producing as much uh, centralised power. But the, the use of the distribu distri uh, distribution network, I think, will go up. And if you get the right price signals where you charge consumers to sell electricity, you charge them less if they send the electricity less and more if they send it further, then you'll get more localised energy systems and more resilient energy systems in place. And the distribution network will be utilised more and therefore become more valuable because every time electricity touches the network, the network gets paid. And so I think consumers will self-supply, so they'll want to size their system to supply their own needs, but they might upsize to be able to monetize their roof space and supply electricity to others. And it's not just about selling electricity, it can also be about providing capacity to the market. So what's that? That's providing electricity in the peak uh, or load balancing, and that's the most expensive electricity. So you, the, the household could actually earn uh, considerable sums of money by storing electricity in the battery and supplying it into the network in the peak period. So the question is around, uh, will you have these kind of isolated microgrids or embedded networks, or is there really a need for them to be connected? And I think the answer is ideally yes, because although you get economies of scale with like a, a, a strata development, say if you had 20 or 30 lots, you would need a smaller solar and battery system on a per dwelling basis than if you were individually sizing it, but you've still got this phenomena uh, in winter time that would, em would emerge. And if you are in a remote community, how you solve that is with a diesel generator backup. And the grid effectively is that uh, in, in, instead. It's pretty interesting because there are exactly those examples such as Calbarri, which now has got a, a whole suite of renewables that have been put on and effectively they can actually cut it off from the main grid. If they, the main grid went down, they can actually isolate themselves, but they're part of the main grid. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question is how do you deal with um, entropy within councils where there's a reluctance to reform the rules uh, and make them relevant and contemporary and, uh, and how do you deal with people that have wacky ideas? <laughs> uh, on uh, on, on uh, people that have unusual ideas, I don't, I don't know how to do, deal with that individual, but what I would say is it's a democracy and you actually only need 50% of the people in the council to reform the legislation. So I'd get busy talking to the people that can be persuaded and influenced and advocating with your elected members are the change that you want to see and uh, you know and, and be smart about it be sophisticated uh, find out what other local governments have already reformed and sh show how your local government is an outlier and that they need to bring themselves in line with market norms and um, uh, be persistent I think that you may hear no the first time uh, but that doesn't have to be the end of it and um, well that's maybe I, that's the Maybe it's the advice I'm giving myself on council at the city of Perth. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thanks for your question, Paul. Uh, there were two parts to it. The first is about the situation in South Australia. And uh, the second question is about uh, the kind of feed-in tariff for, for batteries. So the, the South Australian uh, energy system, who's not heard about what's happened in South Australia with the energy? Everyone has, great. So there were blackouts um, and uh, renewable energy was blamed when actually it was a problem with interconnectors and uh, transmission lines and some software issues. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there, were, there was quite a lot of opprobrium heaped on renewables as being the, the source of this problem. Uh, but then, uh, basically, Elon Musk, uh, who's the founder of Tesla, started talking with a guy called Mike Cannon-Brooks, who is a 37-year-old billionaire who founded a company called Atlassian. And they started tweeting each other, suggesting how they could solve this problem in South Australia. Because Mike Cannon-Brooks has a venture capital firm and raises money, and obviously Elon Musk has the batteries. So they, basically, Elon said, uh, you know, we'll will um, provide the batteries in 100 days or you can have the system for free. 
And so it got very exciting. The Prime Minister got on the phone to Elon Musk and uh, all of a sudden there's talk about uh, batteries being a part of the solution. And it culminated in the uh, Federal Energy Minister, Josh Frydenberg, trying to make an announcement around a uh, solution to solve the problem coming from Snowy Hydro in Tasmania. And he was trying to do a press conference and it was hijacked by uh, the Premier from South Australia, Jay Weatherall. And I thought it was, it was quite beautiful to see uh, the fact that both were fighting over who had the sexiest renewable energy solution. Uh, and it was, it, I almost think it, it was a, a, um, the ushering in of a new era because the, the conversation had been so polarised to renewables is the problem, to renewables is not, to now, oh, renewables is part of the solution and I've got a better idea than yours. And that's really the kind of competition I'd like to be seeing happening. And I, I do think it marks a shift in the conversation that we're having in Australia about it. It was a very exciting um, uh, press conference. I would uh, encourage you to go and watch the um, video online. It was refreshing to watch. It was. Yes. Yeah, so ar ar around that, uh, ba what battery storage, you can put batteries in your house, but this is about grid connected batteries, so large batteries. And what they do is they fill them up during the day and then they use that uh, at night rather than turning on coal fired power stations and gas fired power stations. So, and it, it works, it's, um, uh, it's becoming cost effective. And I think we'll be starting to see a lot of them installed in Australia, so that's part of the solution. Now in terms of electric vehicles, they're effectively a battery on wheels. So EVs can be providing that same power to households or housing developments as well. Uh, and I think that they will be part of the energy mix as well as standalone battery systems in people's houses. And it's going to basically displace petrol the demand for petrol will be displaced by this new energy demand. And the more renewables that we have uh, on the system, the, the more carbon free these electric vehicles will be. So the feed-in tariff for the battery, at the moment if you sell your surplus electricity into the network, you get about seven cents per kilo hour, 7.135 cents. Uh, but if you put your battery sourced electricity into the network, you still only get that. Uh, and even if you're supplying that electricity in the peak, it doesn't really matter. So really what we need is a time of day feed-in tariff, that uh, the feed-in tariff is commensurate with the value that that electricity is providing to the network at that time of day. And it's something I've been talking about for quite a while, and the former State Energy Minister, Mike Nahan, was actually quite uh, positive about it. I'm yet to see what the new Energy Minister, Ben Wyatt, has to say about this concept, but it will be game-changing because it will make the payback period for batteries much faster, uh, and uh, we'll see a lot more of them deployed. Hi, Leod from Humble Impact. Um, I just wanted to ask you around um, the discussions happening around monopolies with new technologies, like throwing rocks at the Google bus, et cetera. Um, and how does your technology kind of combat those criticisms where these monopolies are taking over what should be really citizen-owned um, businesses? And can you talk more about that? So is your question about... Uh, your particular blockchain? Power ledger? Yeah. Um, well... I think that the technology will enable more community-owned uh, renewables to connect to the grid and uh, communities to be able to uh, readily trade uh, fractions of ownership with each other and um, aggregate funds together. So I think it's actually going to be uh, offer real assistance to communities. Uh, in terms of the... Um, the cost, I guess, I think is what you're asking for the service. Uh, the, 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 the charging regime for power ledger is very low uh, and the, the greater the volume of electricity that's traded, um, it, it, become, it becomes lower. But I, if you wanted a system where you didn't need, well, you either need an, an intermediary or you need the blockchain uh, to be able to uh, operate without an intermediary. Any other questions? 
Well, if not, I think it would be uh, very appropriate for us to warmly thank Gemma for coming and...